Peace will fill the world when we finally understand that only from within can it be spread throughout the land. Every single person living peace in what we do, only then will our dream come true. Only then will our dream come true. Only then will our dream come true. Good morning, friends. I'm Leona Evans, minister at Unity of San Luis Obispo, an inclusive, progressive, spiritual community affirming the good in all life. Welcome to our Sunday morning live stream. It's wonderful that you're here this morning to share this time with us, and I'm, of course, delighted to be here. We have a very special service for you today. I know I say that a lot, but we have a, a very powerful talk on love, beautiful inspirational music, a powerful meditation, and an opportunity to feel our oneness with the presence of God, the living spirit of truth within us and all creation. So let's take a moment to prepare for our time together. Let's just take a deep breath and relax and become comfortable where we are or find a place of comfort. We can relax our bodies. We can relax, relax the muscles in our neck and open our minds and hearts to the opportunity to feel and know more of our divine relationship with spirit and our purpose in life. Again, let's take another deep breath. Let us affirm together, I am now open and receptive to the living spirit of truth. Once again, I am now open and receptive to the living spirit of truth. And so it is. Amen. Well, let's open our service once again with a joy song performed by Matthew J. Evans. Good morning. Today we're going to sing Let Your Light Shine. Please sing along with the lyrics in the bottom of the screen. Let your light shine wherever you are. Let your light shine the world needs a star To show the way to wise ones Who seek a holy birth To radiate a message Of love and peace on earth Let your light shine At work or at play Let your light shine for this is the way To make the world a brighter place A place where life is filled with grace And joy will come winging Your heart will be singing When you let your own light shine Let your light shine to bless and to cheer Let your light shine The message is clear The world takes on a splendor When love illumines you It soon reflects the sender And then the world shines too Let your light shine Whatever the hour Let your light shine For you have the power To make the world a brighter place A place where life is filled with grace And joy will come winging 
your heart will be singing when you let your own light shine. Have a great morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was just a great job. Thank you. Well, today I want to focus on the power of love. And I think it's really important to work with this idea at this particular time because in our society today, there seems to be very little of it. All we have to do is turn on the news and find a number of our prominent political leaders demeaning and disrespecting one another. Now, not only is this behavior setting a negative example for young people, but their lack of maturity and foresight prevents these lawmakers from creating anything close to bipartisan interaction or positive outcomes. These elected officials seem to really believe that their opponents have no value as individuals, as human beings, as professionals, and need to be treated as enemies. Now, rather than focusing on the needs of the American people, they seem to be most concerned with stopping the opposing party from getting what they want. This attitude can only exacerbate problems, not correct them. And if this is the quality of interaction that we're exposed to so often, it's too easy to be dragged down by it, to lose faith in humanity, to lose faith in our democracy, and to feel alienated and, and not really safe. So we're going to talk about love, experience love, and the first act of love that I would like to ask you to participate in on a daily basis beginning today is to pray with our members of Congress to experience divine discernment. That is to open their minds and hearts to higher and more compassionate ways of thinking and interacting with their colleagues. There's no need to tell them how to think but to allow them the freedom to disagree with respect. We can be reminded to make our affirmations whenever we hear words of anger and disrespect being bandied about by one of our lawmakers in Congress. Instead of letting those words get us down, let us view this as an opportunity to focus on the ever-present unconditional love of spirit. For example, you sit down to watch the news because after all you are a voter and you want to keep current with what's going on and you start hearing arguments and vicious conversation, vicious uh, name calling and, and all kinds of things that really have nothing to do with what we want to see and hear. And we think, it's hopeless, it's ridiculous, it's bizarre. And yet, because we have this assignment, we then think, ah, another opportunity to remember the unconditional love of God. And so we take a deep breath and we take a look, better turn the sound off, take a look at, the subject for whom we are praying and look at that person beyond personality with the eyes of love and say to yourself, we are both created through the power of the unconditional love of the same God. Therefore, we're connected. And I can know the truth for you. I can know that you're wise, that you have divine intuition and that you're guided by it, that you are devoted to your work as a lawmaker and to being honest, and that you communicate with respect and love wherever you are. That's an example of affirmative prayer. We just continue to give thanks 
with what we don't yet see in expression, but we know is there. We know it's there because God is there. And so let's take this assignment to heart and remember at least once a day. Personally, I make an effort to remember it every time I hear their names or see their photos or listen to their tirades about whatever their issues are. And I start to affirm that we are one in spirit and that they are blessed with divine wisdom and divine intelligence. So let's focus now on the idea of love. Love is much more than an emotion. Love is a power, the greatest power in the world. Love is the connecting power that unites us with one another, within ourselves and with the world around us. At its most rudimentary level, love expresses as gravity, drawing everything to itself. And at its highest level in consciousness, love is defined as agape love or unconditional love, which unites all life with a recognition of the presence of God within us all. This is why in Unity and New Thought, one of our most important affirmations is, I behold the Christ in you, or I behold the Spirit of God in you, or the divine I am. The more able we are to recognize in others the same presence of God that indwells us, the greater and more fulfilling the power of love becomes in our lives, and the more love we will attract into our experiences. So, to put it simply, love is our inherent ability to recognize our oneness with others and with life itself. And this is the basis of the law of attraction. And this is why it's so important to focus on what we have in common with others. When we see something that we have in common with others, we're experiencing a type of unity. Even the smallest thing has the power to help us see more clearly, to be able to see beyond behaviors and personalities and go right to the heart of love, which is to feel drawn to one another in unity. One of the greatest thinkers on the subject of love, one of my favorite philosophers, is 20th century philosopher, author, and mystic Martin Buber, who developed a powerful understanding of the nature of human relationships called I and thou. Now, one of the turning points in Martin Buber's life that influenced his understanding of I and thou, which of course we'll talk about a little later, came about when he was a professor in college. Buber had a daily routine. He was very spiritual and very religious. It was very meaningful to him, and it was centered around his time of prayer. Buber set aside time each day for prayer and let it be known that at that time of day, he was not to be disturbed. However, one day while he was in prayer, his assistant knocked at his door and told Buber a student needed to see him. Well, even though he wasn't happy by this disturbance, he agreed to meet with the student anyway. During their time together, Buber answered the student's questions. He kept the meeting short and he returned to the, this time of prayer that was so important to him. Well, later on the same day, Buber was informed that the student had taken his own life. This news was very shocking and disturbing 
to Buber and it caused him to spend a great deal of time reflecting on whether or not he could have made a difference to the young man if he had listened to the messages behind his questions. In other words, had he given the student in front of him the same attention as he had given to God in prayer, might the student have been blessed by it in some way? Then he asked himself, was a vertical relationship with an unseen God more important than a human expression of God right in front of him? Now, I just want to point out that Martin Buber did not believe that he was responsible for the student's death, only that by not extending himself and being fully present, both of them were cheated. It was then that Buber realized that true worship was seeing God in every face, and it became his passion to write about it and to live it. In his book, a very short but powerful book for which he is most famous, called I and Thou, Buber says, the I and thou relationship is characterized by mutuality, directness, presentness, and intensity. It's a bold leap into the experience of the other while simultaneously being transparent, present, and accessible. Now, this is a far cry from the level of relationship that we commonly experience in our day-to-day -day lives. So, Buber talked about two levels of relationship, one called the I-thou and the other I-it. We'll talk more about that when we come back from listening to the beautiful music of Brett Mitchell and Matthew J. Evans. Here's a beautiful song from Michelle Legrand and the great lyric team of Alan and Marilyn Bergman. You must believe in spring is the name of the song. It's just so gorgeous. Here we go. One, two, three.
just as a dream is sure, its leaf will reappear. It knows its emptiness is just a time of year. The frozen mountain dreams of April's melting streams. Now crystal clear, it seems you must believe in spring. You must believe in love and trust it's on its way. Just as the sleeping rose awaits the kiss of May. So many worth of snow are things that come and go. Where what you think you know you can't be certain of. Must believe in spring and love. Well, just a gorgeous, gorgeous song. My, huh? Yeah, one of the most beautiful yeah, ever. <laughs> Michelle Legrand from 1967. I think the lyric was added the next year uh, by Alan and Marilyn Bergman. Huh, just they wrote a lot together. It's one of my favorites this ever. I love it. Love the version with uh, Tony Bennett and Bill Evans too. What a gorgeous song. Yeah. Such a beautiful and inspiring song. Thank you so much, Brett Mitchell and Matthew J. Evans, for sharing your talents with us. Beautiful interpretation of this inspiring song. And thank you for sharing your gifts with us every week. It's a joy to do this service together with you and to know that we're a team sharing our light and our love with all who tune in. So, we're talking about the power of love to lift us out of despair. We talked about Martin Buber, incredible philosopher, my very favorite, who developed out of his own personal experience a framework called I and Thou. And he explained that there are two kinds of relationships that we encounter in our lives. One is called I-Thou and the other called I-It. He said that the I-Thou can only be spoken with the whole being. The I-It can never be spoken with the whole being. He called I-Thou the world of relationships and I-It the world of experience. Now, for example, much of our daily interaction takes place in the world of experience, in the world of the senses, the world of things. We interact with professionals who provide us with services for the most part, or those for whom we provide services. Very often we're a number in a huge, almost universal filing system, and our verbal interaction usually consists of discussing the type of services, the quality of the services, and the price of the services. There really is little time to engage in small talk and certainly no inclination to discuss matters of a personal nature. Now, in these situations, that type of conversation would be inappropriate and inefficient, a waste of time. The person or we are on the job and we have tasks to perform and we need to find the facts and figures that will help us do that. Now, of course, we want to be polite and pleasant, but there's no expectation of having an intimate interaction. These are often brief connections between a customer service representative and a customer. These are typical I-it relationships, and they often work 
very well in the context of what they are. No intimacy is expected because the focus is on the product or the service. However, just because we're used to dealing at that level, when we bring components of an I-it relationship into our personal and family relationships, it doesn't work nearly as well. In fact, it doesn't work well at all. This is because the I-it relationship is most often one of expectations. There's a product or a service expected. The customer service representative speaks and represents the company, which automatically puts the business first before any type of relationship. However, when we attempt to treat our loved ones as products rather than people, the results can be disastrous. It seems that part of the human condition that most of us are unconscious of, otherwise we wouldn't do it, is that we have built-in expectations of everyone who enters our lives. We expect our parents to behave in certain ways in order to be good parents, our children, our spouses, our ministers, our teachers. Generally speaking, these expectations can vary somewhat from culture to culture, but the fact is the expectations are there. This is what a good dad looks like. This is what a good spouse acts like. And if we don't consciously cultivate the love, the genuine spontaneity in our relationships, all parties begin to feel more like products than human beings. For example, we're accustomed to believing this is how a good parent, child, friend, spouse should behave, and you are not meeting my expectations. You see, whether we say those words or not, we often communicate these ideas to our significant others without realizing it, and our significant others communicate them to us. This is not what I expected. Your behavior is not what I expected. It doesn't fit the mold of the good mom or the good spouse or the good minister or the good teacher. Again, most of the time, we don't know we're doing this. But because there are spoken or unspoken expectations of us in our intimate relationships, there are times when we just feel inadequate and unsuccessful to be that person, to be good enough. So, the I, it works when it works. It works when the product is first and our interaction serves the best use of the product. The I, thou relationship can only work when we let go of the expectations of what the perfect whatever should be and approach that individual, that dear one whom we really love but don't necessarily know how to express it, and treat them with the pure love that lets go of and releases expectation and focuses on the power of unity, acceptance, and confirmation of all that we were created to be. Now, the I-Thou relationship is not based on expectations, but as Buber states, it's a dynamic state of being lived in the present. It's a bold leap into the experience of the other while simultaneously being transparent, present, and accessible. In other words, an I-thou experience does not bring any baggage to the moment. 
When two people come together, whether or not it's planned or unplanned, the only moment that matters is the present moment. And it brings with it a type of surprise and spontaneity that causes not only a profound connection, but a lifting in consciousness to a heightened level of awareness. It is then, Buber says, that you feel the presence of God. Buber refers to God as the eternal thou and is present in the act of a pure and loving I and thou experience. That experience between two individuals ignites the presence of spirit. Imagine being with someone without having to be conscious of how we look, what we're going to say, whether or not we're making a good impression, whether or not we have the other's approval. And what if the only thing that mattered is how wonderful it is to be in the presence of one of God's creations? And our purpose would be other-oriented instead of being self-oriented, to let their joy be our joy, to be with them in an intimate and authentic way, just by the very act of looking into their soul. Now, clearly these mystical I-Thou experiences of the purest kind don't happen all the time. And mainly because, generally speaking, we are too preoccupied with ourselves or our electronic devices. We take our loved ones for granted. And again, not because we don't care, but because of the expectations that we talked about before. Expectations of being with the person that knows what we want before we ask and meets our every need. However, once we have a genuine I-Thou experience, we never forget it. Have you ever had an experience in your life, and I know you've had, and I know you've probably had them in nature or when a loved one was perhaps close to death, but in this experience, you encountered someone or an aspect of nature, and in an instant were overcome with such a powerful feeling of love and wholeness that it was as though time stood still and there was beauty all around you. You were caught up in it, and you relaxed into it. This is an I and thou experience. We don't seem to seek it out, but suddenly it seems to happen, and, and sometimes in the most unlikely of places. Of course, this transcendent experience is the goal that many people seek during meditation, but too often, it doesn't come when summoned in that way. Now, again, I know you've had experiences like this in your life, and it's important to remember them and to know that they're possible to recreate. I want to share my most unusual and forgettable I-Thou experience with you. A number of years ago, when I was studying TM, Transcendental Meditation, I attended a weekend retreat in a beautiful setting in the woods. We each had private cabins with rustic wooden porches and comfortable deck chairs. Now, the morning after I arrived, before the activity started, I went out to the porch to practice my meditation. I was all by myself, and it was very quiet with a very mild breeze coming through the trees. Well, as soon as I sat down, I could hear what sounded like a very large bee near the back of my head. 
I started to panic until the bee flew into my line of vision. And then all of a sudden, without warning, I felt connected with the bee. I no longer had any fear, just a sense of complete safety and security. The bee hovered about two feet away from me and I stared at it. I couldn't take my eyes from it. I stared at it with pure love and acceptance. Now, what that makes this experience more amazing is that I have mentioned on various occasions, I'm quite phobic about insects, but this time it was different. I truly felt, uh, felt a sense of spirituality between us, a relationship that is really hard to describe in words. Mystics use the term ineffable because it's beyond vocabulary. It's so real. Now that was literally a once in a lifetime experience and I can still recall the feeling. Now I know you're wondering if this experience so long ago resulted in a healing of my fear of insects. Well, it didn't, but that's not the point. The point is, I understood the power of the I-Thou experience. And I know that type of transcendent experience is possible. It's possible for us. People have been describing this type of experience for as long as I can remember. I've read about them. They happen. And so while we can't always plan for or predict an I-Thou experience, we can be open to it and prepare ourselves for it by holding on to those memories that we've experienced before and keeping the faith that there is such a thing as a unity with all life. There is such a thing as unconditional love. There is such a thing as working to create more loving and organic experiences with those in our immediate circle of friends and family. There is such a thing as looking deeply into someone's soul and seeing the face of God. And there's nothing more powerful on this earth than the unifying harmonizing, unconditional love of spirit available to us at all times and in all ways. Martin Buber states, a person cannot approach the divine by re reaching beyond the human. A person cannot approach the divine by reaching beyond the human. To become human is what this individual person has been created for. Let's relax as we move into our time of meditation. Take a deep breath now and relax. This is our time of meditation, contemplation, and integration of today's message. The message is love. The unconditional love of spirit, which is our divine birthright. Ever present, and available to us as we turn toward love, as we embrace the power of the I and Thou. We open the door to becoming one 
with all life. The I and Thou experience gives us the opportunity to affirm one another. To see us as perfect by design. To know that we are more than the way we behave. We are, in fact, spiritual beings created in love, worthy and deserving of being embraced by life itself. God is love. God is the spirit within us all. When we open our minds and hearts to this extraordinary power of love, we bless and are blessed in more ways than we can ever imagine. I focus on sharing my love with others. I focus on remembering that everywhere I look, I see the face of God. And all is well. And so it is. Amen. It's time now in our service to bless the gifts we would share with Unity of San Luis Obispo and to give thanks that we are prospered and blessed in every way. Speaking of the I and thou experience, speaking of the law of attraction, there is a way to draw more financial wealth into your life. Now we know that money is a symbol by itself. It means nothing. But the fact is, it's symbolic of that which we can use to purchase that which we need or want, or to take care of others, or to share our good with others. And we also know that the more we do that, the more we give, the more we have to give 
because we're focusing on our prosperity. And if I give a gift to where I receive my spiritual inspiration, then I have to know that I have enough supply to give that gift in love and to bless it, to know it's going to be put to good use and to know that where that came from, there is so much more. So those of us who have a love-hate relationship with money, let's think about the wisdom of that and turn it more into this is a symbol and I can use this symbol to see the face of God in the work that I send it out to do and I bless it and give thanks for it because I know that I always have enough, enough prosperity. Another word for that is the unconditional love of spirit. Please remember a portion of your gifts goes to organizations who support human rights and the conservation and preservation of our precious planet Earth. Let's speak the words of our prosperity statement together. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I give and all that I receive. This song is a uh, traditional Appalachian tune. Uh, I first heard it from the Paul Winter Consort album, Winter Song, uh, from 1986. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, song called The Cherry Tree.
the cherry tree, a uh, traditional Appalachian tune. And uh, first, you can hear it on uh, Paul Winter's Winter Song album from 1986. That's a fun piece, huh, Matthew? That's so pretty. Yeah, I love it. Uh, it's, it was fun. I like it. It's one of my favorites. Thank you so much, Brett and Matthew, for your wonderful rendition of that Appalachian folk melody. Just lovely. Let's sing our peace song, shall we? Let's speak the words of our prayer for protection. Together, the light of God surrounds us, the love of God enfolds us, the power of God protects us, the presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is. Friends, please remember to press the like button and also to share your comments with us. We really, really enjoy hearing from you and we appreciate your ideas and suggestions for talks. Also, please remember to listen to our Get Off Your Affirmation podcast where Matthew and I share inspirational and informational ideas that are bound to inspire you and give you pleasure. God bless you and have a wonderful week. You deserve it. Every single person living peace in what we do, only then will our dream come true. Only then will our dream come true. Only then will our dream come true.